let me just get through the good news. Let me let me just get through shit. Let's start chat. Um, let me make sure that this is working correctly. Okay, that's right. All right. To start us off, um, let me explain uh, this for people who either don't know or aren't American and don't care. Uh, in the U.S. court system, oh, and before I start this, let me say that my Halloween costume is Sneed. I am in full denim overalls uh, with a red hat on and a green shirt. And I have a I have a monster right now, but it will be alcohol later, I hope. Um, so I, I'm I'm in I'm fully I'm fully decked out. I look as American as as possible. It looks <laughs> it, it, it's impossible to tell if I'm just like a fat American wearing overalls or if I'm uh, a fat American in a costume. <laughs> I'm not doing it. No, I'm, you'll never. Maybe one day I'll take a picture. Maybe one day I'll post my wonderful Sneed outfit. But for now, you just have to take my word for it. Uh, the good news. Um, so in the United States, there are several layers of courts. There is um, at the federal level. Well, first there's state court and then there's federal court. So at the federal court, when you file a lawsuit that involves um, for various reasons, ends up in federal civil court. Um, if you're unhappy with something, you can appeal it uh, to the appellate court, which as the name implies is where appeals go. And appellate courts have, I think between like seven and 10 judges in total for the district and the district incorporates multiple states. Um, and when they handle an appeal, three of the judges look at the appeal and they will make a determination on that. Um, I think they actually have to approve it first, but, uh, yeah, so they have to first approve it. And then the three of them look at the issue and then they write what's called an opinion, uh, or sometimes they write an opinion. Uh, the opinion is very important because when a judge considers the facts of something and comes to a decision and it's published as an opinion, um, in that particular district, um, that opinion is, is binding precedent but that opinion can also be imported to other districts and at other lower courts so it's very important when a precedent is set uh, at the appellate court it's uh, something that people will take notice of and, and cite references to in litigation moving forward so it's important that they get it right and if a court fucks up um that's a that's a bit of a harsh way to put that if uh judicial oversight is made and uh procedural error is done or if some facts were not considered or if an attorney fucks up <laughs> then, then uh, sometimes you might want to appeal the appeal and when you want to do that you have two options but in order your first and most immediate op option is for an en banc uh, which means uh, on the bench or full bench I can't remember it's Latin and it basically means the entire bench. So you have three out of 10, seven to 10 judges for the appeals court. And then sometimes if you want to appeal the decision, you can file for en banc, in which case all the judges get involved. Um, the judges will vote on if they want to look at the case again, all of them, uh, not just the three that were involved. And then uh, the judges will um, do majority votes moving forward uh, for the case. Uh, if, if you're unhappy with that, by the way, or if you're not granted, you can take it up to the Supreme Court. However, the odds of getting into these uh, higher courts are very, very slim. Um, in the 10th district, where Greer is suing me for copyright infringement, 3% of cases make it to en banc review. 3% uh, of cases which are appealed for to en banc are accepted by en banc. And then in the Supreme Court of the United States, the highest court in the country, 1% of, petition, of petitions are given what's called writ of seratory, I think is how you pronounce that. It's a, it's a weird word. Basically just means that they're going to look at it. Uh, very few, I think it's like 80 a year tops out of like a, a lot of like 8,000 petitions, uh, 80 get writ. Um, however, we're not there yet. We are at en banc. On Monday, which would be yesterday, uh, I had my new attorney, 
in the district of because uh I will say absolutely nothing about this except that uh, I now have a new attorney in in the the Greer case, who is Hardeen, who I've worked with with uh, the Melinda Scott bullshit lawsuits, um, and had a good good repertoire with him. So now he's looking at that, and he filed an on bank petition. Um, the facts of the case amount to this. Let me try to on bank. I'll say it as many times as I want. Chat. Uh, the, the way that it breaks down is like this. There are three main issues. Uh, issue A is that um, they ignored Supreme Court precedent regarding um, uh, links being considered copyright infringement. The Supreme Court has uh, directly decided that links in websites to infringing content is not copyright infringement where the link is posted. Uh, that's a big no-no is uh, for the lower courts to try to overrule the Supreme Court and the decision. Um, if they intend to create a new precedent around that, it has to be really thoughtfully done. The second one is that there are different kinds of copyright cases. Greer did not sue me for copyright infringement. He has sued me for contributory copyright infringement. And when the appellate court uh, came in his favor they applied rules that were developed for direct copyright infringement to a contributory copyright infringement case, which means that they have um, muddled the different theories of copyright law uh, in a way that is erroneous, I believe. And then third and finally, um, the appellate court chastised uh, Scordis, my previous attorney, for not raising fair use as a defense. However, um, at that point in the case, fair use could not be raised as a defense. You don't raise fair use as an affirmative defense until you submit an answer. We had not submitted an answer. It was a uh, motion for summary judgment, and it would be inappropriate to submit fair use as an affirmative defense in that case because that requires evidence, and you don't submit evidence until you answer a complaint. So that is a procedural error, uh, which is different than an error of law. The, uh, my belief is that they have just completely messed up um, the, the actual order in which things are supposed to go, which happens even with, you know, really experienced uh, judges. You can't remember the ins and outs of every single facet of the sprawling complexities of United States case law, which is why you can sometimes get an en banc review from 10 different judges, right? So, um, when you file for the petition to go to en banc, um, generally speaking, for the brevity of the court, because so few of these cases are accepted, there is no reason to answer it. Um, so, if you are the opposing counsel, somebody files for en banc, you don't generally say, hey, don't grant this, because that's not allowed. There, there's... The odds of being accepted are so slim that it's unnecessary for you to oppose a petition for en banc because 97% of the time it's going to be rejected anyways. But if the court does ask for you to submit a answer for why en banc should not be granted, um, chances are it's already been accepted. And what you see in front of you is the 10th appellate court um, telling uh, Greer's attorneys, uh, Bacharach, Moritz, and Rossman, oh, those are the circuit judges, um, they're telling uh, Russell Greer and his attorneys to file a response to the petition for en banc review, which almost certainly means that it will be accepted. And uh, to give you an idea of how very unlikely this is, it's sort of like a highlight of an attorney's career to go to an en banc review. Um, it's like, it's something that you would like humble brag about. Like, yeah, you know, I've been, I've been to the en banc uh, in the 10th circuit, you know, no big deal. Uh, it, was, it was just, you know, it's just a, a technical procedural. It's like, a, it's like a thing. Okay. If you ever watch the show, making a murderer, there's a part of that where they're, um, they went to the appellate court to try and overturn the conviction for murder. And then the appellate court made a, uh, uh, some issues. So they filed for en banc. 
And you can like, they're interviewing all the attorneys responsible for the case and they're like freaking like, oh my God, it's fucking accepted. It's on bonk, it's on bonk. <laughs> so uh, it's like, a, it's like, it's pretty, it's a pretty big deal, but it's not done yet. So who knows? Maybe it won't be granted, but um, I'm very happy to hear this. And uh, it, the thing is that it also took like, I think it was 17 hours between um, the request for review being submitted and this subsequent filing asking for a response from the opposing counsel. So I have a gut feeling, I have no reason to actually think this, it's just a gut feeling, that they expected the uh, petition and they had already decided that they were going to review it. Because just like the, the third thing, the appellate court basically condemned me for not filing fair use as a defense um, because at a stage where it's not usual to submit fair use as an affirmative defense because it's just it's just out of order like mathematically speaking that doesn't make sense so if that in any way factored into their decision that needs to be looked at uh, regardless so that's where we're at it's a pretty good thing uh it's a great thing actually um and who knows? I mean, it could get granted and then we still get lost. That's what happened with the making the murder case. <laughs> they got granted the on bonk review and then the full panel judge uh, said, actually, no, he's still fucking guilty as shit. And there's no issue here. So, I mean, that could still happen. But it's uh, it's, it's exciting to um, host a, a shitty forum and then end up in one of the highest courts in the country because... Um, People take issue with you making fun of their shitty fucking music. Such is life, chat. Such is life. Thank you for watching this clip. This is the CACA Lofa. Remember to like and subscribe.